Simon. Anyway, uh, and I looked for these, but I didn't see any. Oh, we saw uh, them last time. Yeah, we saw them last time we went. Oh, really? Yeah. They're by the yeah. checkout. All right, okay. Where, the, where were they? Kind of by the checkout. They're in the snack section. Near the checkout? Yeah. Yeah, near the checkout. In the Renaissance Costco? What's the Renaissance? It's the Renaissance so, one is the one near FedEx. Oh, yeah. It's a, we were looking yeah, for the exactly. one by REI and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DJ's. That's okay, the one. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. I'm glad. I, I didn't do a thorough search. I just <laughs> casually looked. Okay, um, let me first ask if there are questions. Uh, I put the solutions. Uh, on uh, the web class web page, with the help of the TA Adrian Chapman, who did problem two in Mathematica, I did it with my fingers and kept screwing up. Because most of the time I didn't have my reading glasses, so I did it on that. Anyway, um, if you're curious as to all the details, they're they're on the web page. I also made up a second homework set that's mostly about functional derivatives. And I put that on the uh, web page. It's I don't think it's very difficult. And um, when should it be due? Um, would next Monday be good, or would it be better next Wednesday? Next. Wednesday. Because you haven't. You, have, you perhaps have not looked. You're, you'd say next Wednesday. All right. Why don't we say next Wednesday? So a week from. Nine days from now. Right. Um, now let's see. Did I get the things that I? I just printed a couple of things. I forgot to get them. Damn. You just got scripting. It's epic. that Weinberg identity. It may, some of you may have seen it elsewhere. I only have seen it in um, uh, Weinberg's book and his lectures, I, I, although he didn't derive it. So let me, let me um, give you a quick derivation of it. So, the first thing is we write epsilon e to the plus and minus epsilon t as plus and minus d d epsilon of e to the plus and minus epsilon t, which is pretty clear. Um, and now we're going to assume that the limits t going to plus and minus infinity of f of t or f of plus or minus infinity, and these exist. The thing doesn't go to infinity. So then we want to look at the integral, epsilon, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of t e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt. And what we want to do is we want to show that this is in fact equal to f of infinity minus f, no, plus f of minus infinity. Yeah. I, I don't know, should it be d by dt? Like, I yes. Mean, okay, just making sure. It's epsilon, so I don't know, maybe it's weird. But yes, yes, of course. Sweet. Chocolate time. <laughs> Which is what's in my notes, I don't know. I, these are actually not the reading glasses, these are computer glasses. D by ET. I'll just use my eyes. 
which don't work that well either. Anyway, um, so the, the trick here is to split this up into two integrals. f of t epsilon e to the epsilon t dt. This is the integral over the negative realizes. And then you have the integral 0 to infinity f of t epsilon e to the minus epsilon t dt. Okay. And now epsilon e to the epsilon t and uh, can be written using these expressions. And the first one then is integral minus infinity to zero f of t d d t e to the epsilon t d t minus integral zero to infinity f of t t e to the minus epsilon t So now we integrate by parts. And for the first time in this course, we're not going to drop the surface terms. Minus infinity to zero. Whoops, yes, that's right. OK, we integrate by parts. We have d by dt, f of t, e to the epsilon t. Minus e to the epsilon t df dt all at dt and then minus integral 0 to infinity d dt <coughs> of f of t e to the minus epsilon t minus e to the minus epsilon t, and I'm going to write this just as f dot dt. I, could, I should have written that, I think, as f dot, just to make it a little bit simpler. OK. So what happens now? Well, this integration gives us f of 0 e to the epsilon 0, which is just f of 0. And then the lower limit we can drop, because that will be e to the epsilon times minus infinity. And that's a big exponential suppressor. So we assume that these limits exist and are finite, and so they're completely blown away by e to the minus epsilon times minus infinity. Um, what's left is this integral, which is minus infinity to 0 e to the epsilon t f dot dt. And now we do this integration. Well, we get f of infinity, but that's blown away by the exponential. And then we have minus this evaluated at 0, which is f of 0, but there's two minus signs. So this gives us f of 0 again. And then we finally have two minus signs. So we have plus integral 0 to infinity. Uh, e to the minus epsilon t f dot dt. OK, so our whole equation then is um, epsilon integral minus infinity plus infinity f of t e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt. And what do we get? We take the limit now. We now let epsilon go to zero in this ex in these two integrals. So we're taking the limit on the right-hand side. 
when we get 2f of 0 uh, minus integral minus infinity to 0 f dot dt plus integral 0 to infinity f dot dt. So all together this is 2 f of 0 minus f of 0. So in other words, this integration gives you f of 0 minus, but minus minus, so plus f of minus infinity. That's what the first integral gives us. And then this one gives us plus f of infinity minus f of 0. So the f's of 0 go away, and this is f of infinity plus f of so that's um, basically the derivation. And of course, this works if you know, the functions are reasonably well behaved. And, uh, so any, any questions? So remember, what we were doing was um, we basically had um, started from something like this, time-ordered product of p of x1 dot 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 p of xn. And we were saying that this was an integral, p double prime, and then the fields p of x1 dot 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 p of xn. And then e to the i s zero free action, and then five prime zero a big d phi, and then divided by the um, um, integral. <coughs> Um, yeah. I 
don't think he ever replies. <laughs> um, and it, I then saw a movie, a famous movie um, about music. It was mainly about Mozart, I forget the name of the movie. Anyway, it was Valier, Valeri, what was the name of the, uh, the Italian who complained that Mozart was so good? Salieri? Salieri, yes. And Salieri, at one point, was said to Mozart, or said to somebody about Mozart's music, the twenty notes. And so, he <laughs> said to the point where he wrote the line for it, that he had twenty Greek letters like that. Had in mind what Salieri said. I, I still think, right? It's just too many Greek letters. Okay. Um, and what we did. So I'm going to skip some of this because it's pretty straightforward. We used uh, Fourier transforms, and um, we then used the fact that uh, phi prime, the wave function of the vacuum is some normalization constant e to the minus one half integral phi prime tilde of p vector squared times the square root of p squared plus m squared and this again is three vector p and this is integrated d q of p over two phi q and all this is in the exponential Pretty clear that's in the exponential, right? And these notes are online, right? So, okay. And so, what happens is then that these two terms add to the action extra terms, and we we absorb them into the action, and they gave us the I epsilon. Sort of repeating some of this. They gave us the term delta as zero of v, which was i over two. And there's an i because we're talking about i as zero. And so if delta as zero has an i, then you get a minus one half. So it's i over two uh, integral square root of p squared plus n squared. And now this was absolute value of phi tilde at p and t plus um, phi tilde at t minus t dqp over t pi q. So that's what that's what these two factors give us, and the. the the plus t means we're at t equals plus infinity, basically, and here we're at t equals minus infinity. Yes? Um, for that first phi e tilde, um, is that supposed to be magnitude squared? Let's give me that again now. For the first term? Yes! yes. Thank you. Okay, and. Um, so what we then did was we wrote this as the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of i epsilon over two integral square root of p squared plus m squared. And now minus infinity plus infinity phi tilde of p and t squared e to the minus epsilon at the value of t dt d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. And then effectively, um, um, this is this integral dt, dt of this is effectively the same thing as the full four-dimensional Fourier transform. In other words, it's lim epsilon goes to zero plus i epsilon over two 
And now we have square root of three vector p squared. This was always three vector p. But now we have um, five tilde of four vector p squared. And now we're just integrating d fourth p over two pi to the fourth. And um, we've taken, uh, we've kept this epsilon, but we've taken the liberty here of just taking the first term in epsilon, because if we expanded this, the other terms would be of second order epsilon. And so then we have an S0 of phi and epsilon, which is S0 of phi plus this uh, delta S0 of phi. And um, that then gave us minus a half integral phi tilde of p absolute value squared. And now this is p squared plus m squared. And it's minus i epsilon equal p over pi to the fourth. OK. So we then um, And um, that is to say, right, P 
tilde of P as psi tilde of P plus J tilde of P over P squared plus M squared minus I epsilon. And when you do that, um, what you find is that S0 of P epsilon J turns into S0 of C and epsilon um, plus a half integral absolute value of J tilde of P squared over P squared plus M squared minus I epsilon D fourth P over 2 pi to the fourth. And that's because you have two terms here, and um, I did it explicitly last time. The part maybe that was a little bit confusing is we had something like p squared plus m squared plus or minus i epsilon over p squared plus m squared um, minus i epsilon, and I, I replace that by one. And the reason is that first of all, the i epsilon in the numerator you can completely ignore. And so this is of the form x over x minus i epsilon. And so this is principal part of x over x um, plus x times i delta of x, but x delta of x is 0. Um, I mean, i pi, isn't it? i pi. I unfortunately don't have those notes with me, but in other words, there's this 1 over x minus i epsilon is principal part of 1 over x um, plus i pi delta of x. I think that that, I, I'm doing this from memory, but I think I've got the factors right. And the, uh, the result is that if you have an x in the numerator, this, this term goes away. And so, consequently, this thing is just principal part of 1, which is just 1. And so this is just simply 1. x delta of x is 0. I mean, um, yes? Is it to the last one? Give me that again. In the last line. In the last line. Yeah, phi star. Try it again. J star, phi tilde. Yeah, phi tilde star. Phi tilde star. T and J tilde. J. Yeah, all these are J tilde. Yeah. You meant the tilde? Yeah. Yeah. I left out the tilde by mistake. These are. What I'm doing in class today, apart from the, the details that I'm filling in, is, is this is all online on the web page correctly. Okay, so um, now before before I go on, do you want me to to, to go through this in in complete detail? I mean, I did it sort of in detail, but I, I, I didn't have a good way of saying, of analyzing that. Do you want me to do it in detail, or are we happy with it as it is? What? The nodding means Could which? You, yeah. Detail, or? Could you do it quickly in detail? Okay, sure. All right. why it's good to do it again in detail is that this is, I think, a simpler way, and I think 
much more straightforward way than the way that Z does it. Because what Z does is he considers, he stays actually in position space and um, thinks of all those derivatives as a matrix, which is okay, and then uses that multiple Gaussian integral formula, whereas it's much, much simpler just to do, to do this. So what we got is um, S of phi epsilon j is then this whole thing here. So minus a half integral, uh, let me just write it in fourth p over the two pi to the fourth out in front and then a big bracket. And now what we're going to write is this thing as phi tilde star on the left and phi tilde on the right and phi is psi plus that. So this is, might as well put this down because I'm not, and you really have to follow, you know, check for mistakes, okay? So this is going to be phi tilde star, so this is psi tilde, in fact, I think I'll use my glasses, these glasses, psi tilde star, of p plus j tilde of p star over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. And now p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. tilde of p over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And we have another bracket because this thing is, oh, I'm going to, just to save space, I'm going to write this as j tilde star of p. And now phi tilde of p is psi tilde of p plus j tilde of p over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon minus j tilde of p times now psi tilde star of p plus j tilde of p star over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. Well, now that I see, I didn't really need the curly brackets. Okay. Of P, okay, because that's sort of obvious. So I 
have done this term. And now there's another term, which is plus psi tilde star p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon uh, times j tilde of p over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So those are the cross terms. And then there's a term that's plus j absolute value squared over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. And now we have these, all these terms. And one is, of course, minus um, j tilde star psi tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon minus j tilde psi tilde star wait a second so there's no denominator there so those are just those terms now remember I argued just a moment ago, that this over that is 1, and this over that is 1. So these terms cancel, the linear terms cancel, which is the whole point of this change of variables. So the other terms then are minus absolute value of j squared over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon from this term, and then minus j squared over p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. OK. And so what happens? This one cancels this one, and we're left with that one. And this one cancels that one, and this one cancels this one. So altogether, what we're left with is simply this. This term minus that. And consequently, what we can say is that this S0 of psi epsilon j, well, it's this term, which is just S0 of psi and epsilon. That's what that is. And then we get a minus sign from here and a minus one half there. So we get plus a half uh, integral j of p absolute value squared tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. So that's, that's how it all works. All right, I think it was good to, I'm glad you asked me to do it. I think this has made it clear. Uh, and you see everything's canceled. thing then is to go back to this formula over here and we can we can simplify things then we can say Let's see, what did we have? We had this thing to be, I suppose I've erased some of the important things. This was e to the i s0 phi epsilon j dt divided by e to the i s0 of phi and epsilon dt. Now, we've seen that this is e to the i 
S0 of psi and epsilon. Um, and then this thing, which is um, plus, remember, it's always e to the i times the action. So this is e to the i over 2. d phi and d psi are the same. It's just a translation, a change of variables, like x goes to x plus 2. And so this thing then, c0 j then, is, and you see this thing doesn't involve phi at all. So this is equal to e to the i S0 of C and epsilon BC, and then this e to the i over 2, and let me just write it like that, where I mean that, divided by an e to the i S0 of phi epsilon B5. Well, these two things are exactly the same, so they cancel, give you 1, and so. So, in other words, this integral, when we change this to d psi, this thing cancels this, and all we're left is that. There's an e here. So we have then as the final result. Let me maybe go over to that board since you guys may want to look at some of this. space, and I left this as an exercise, but if you want, I'll try to do it for you. In position space, this is e to the i over 2 integral j of x delta of x minus x prime j of x prime e fourth x d fourth x prime. And of course, this thing is also vacuum time-ordered product e to the i integral j of x by of x e fourth x. So this is that, is that, is this, where this is the Feynman uh, propagator namely delta of x minus x prime is integral e to the i p x minus x prime divided by e squared plus m squared minus i epsilon e fourth p over two pi four. And once again, in this notation that I'm using, p squared is equal to p vector squared minus p zero squared. And up here, px is p vector dot x vector minus p0 x0. And z uses the 
the opposite sign convention. As I said, these conventions, unfortunately, are equally um, equally common in the literature, which is really too bad. One of them dominated the whole switch. Okay, so should I should I fill in the step that goes from there to there? You're okay, but maybe somebody else isn't okay. In this homework problem, by the way, I describe in a little more detail, I, I describe what this means. I've already told you that this is physics notation for a certain expression, but I didn't quite tell you what this was. And so um, maybe just to make the
Let me, let me use Y. Those derivatives are taken at J equals zero. Here I'm just doing D by the epsilon. This is the ordinary, this is what I said was physics notation, where delta Y is the function delta X minus Y. And so the second variational derivative here It's um, partial to partial epsilon, partial epsilon prime of z0 of j plus epsilon <coughs> delta y plus epsilon prime delta z. Add, of course, epsilon equals epsilon prime. By the way, it could you just do me a favor and look at the the, the homework uh, assignment? Is is this exactly the notation that I use? So I don't want to mislead you. Uh, you use the delta notation. Like this. Yeah. Like that. I mean, this equation base. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. All right, so that's what that's what this phys this physics notation um, you see everywhere in the physics not literature these expressions like this, and um, I don't know I've never seen them explained in this way. Uh, it's the all supposed to just intuit what what this means on the left hand side, and um, in some cases it's very straightforward, but in other cases. It's Okay. Any questions? We're not very hungry today. No. All right. Yeah. Um, I have one. Yeah. Why doesn't that? Why doesn't your double derivative bring down two propagators? Why don't you get two propagators? Well, because that's the homework problem, but let me get um, When you differentiate the first time, you get this. But when you differentiate again, um, uh, you're differentiating this, of course. And um, when you differentiate the first time, you bring down a um, when, all right. Let, let, let me just try to do it. You differentiate the first time. If you're differentiating this, you bring down a delta and a j, and you still have the exponential. Then, when you differentiate a second time, you differentiate what has come down, namely delta j, but you also have to differentiate the uh, exponent again. And then you set j equal to zero. And at that point, um, what you've got is, I mean, I think if you do it carefully using this, this formalism that's very explicit, it should work out. I see it now. If, um, if it's not working out, send me an email. Um, and All right. By the way, um, so one student said to me by email that the athletics department insisted that I write a syllabus and that in the syllabus I um, say that the required book is Z's book or the recommended book is Z's book so he can get reimbursed. Um, I don't like to write syllabuses so I'm just going to write something up that you should not take very seriously. All right. But I'm going to post it on the website just to satisfy the uh, the athletics department. In my view, of course, American universities should get rid of intercollegiate athletics completely. 
and concentrate on simply intramural sports so that all of the students get some exercise and no athletic scholarships and uh, the America and American universities stop wasting money on uh, producing entertainment for the uh, cable television industry. Um, in fact, the net loss, I'm told, to American universities each year is $12 billion because of intercollegiate athletics. $12 billion is more than twice the total NSF budget. It's um, about half the NIH budget. So it's a lot of money. And um, it's about what's spent on manned space flight, which is another total loss. Um, So I've gotten all that out of my system. Um, all right, so let's go on with the lecture. And um, there are a couple of magical extensions of this. And I, I don't actually like them very much, but I'll write them down for you because you'll see them in actually shouldn't have erased one, I'm just erasing, but since I've already done it, um, um, So just to finish this, um, what you can show is that the time ordered product of, let us say, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, is then, 1 over i to the 4th, a 4th variation of derivative of z0 of j with respect to j1, j2, j3, j4, of course at j equals 0. And what you get from that is minus delta of x1 minus x2 times delta of x3 minus x4 minus delta of x1 minus x3 delta of x2 minus x4 minus delta x1 minus x4 delta of x2 minus x3. Of course, all this is in the free theory. So this is how the free fields work. Now suppose we actually add a, another term to the uh, to the action, um, and in fact, what happens as as I mean, you, you, I, I think you've learned in, in in a quantum mechanics course that scattering amplitudes are basically final state, initial state, time ordered product. Anyway, it's meant to be a T. Time ordered product of E to the minus I B of T integrated D, let's say DT prime. In other words, if you're doing quantum mechanics, you have the free Hamiltonian. If you're doing ordinary scattering periods, just P squared over 2M, and then you have some V interaction. Or you're um, doing something more elaborate. And you have some uh, some uh, potential v, and I have v of t prime because this is in the interaction picture, um, which which means that v of t prime is v, and that would be e to the minus i h zero t plus i h zero t prime. I think I've got the signs right. That's the interaction picture, right? I think I've got the signs right. So in other words, um, what we, what, what, the analogous thing here is that we'd be interested in something like e to the minus i integral P of phi, d fourth x, again time ordered in the vacuum or between other states. 
where P is just a term that we'd add to the, remember I wrote down the, I wrote, well, I, I don't know, maybe when I, I haven't written down the Hamiltonian in a while. H0, of course, is a half integral. Um, pi squared plus grad phi squared plus m squared pi squared d cubed x. Pi being conjugate to phi, so that phi of x t pi of y t commutator of i delta x minus y, these are space variables. And if we say that h0 is h, is h0 <coughs> plus um, integral p of phi d cubed x, then you might expect that we would have to deal with a uh, time-ordered product of this sort of expression, where again the time dependence is that induced by the Hamiltonian h0. It's like the interaction so this is something that would be uh, relevant. And this thing, what would it be? Well, it would be an integral e to the i s0 of phi and epsilon, but now minus i integral p d4 of x divided by integral e to the i s0 of phi and epsilon d phi. So it's like z0, except that instead of having something that's linear in phi so that we could compute it exactly, it's a polynomial in phi, or some other function. Well, the magical formula is that you can say, well, what is this? This is e to the minus i integral p of this was p of phi. Well, phi is just 1 over i, the variational derivative with respect to j of x, d4 of x. All that acting on c0 of j at j equals 0. So this is, this, this is rather, I think, too fancy a formula, but it's um, it does make sense, but it's it's pretty abstract. And if we generalize to a fully interacting theory, then we would have the physical vacuum here, uh, the time order products. In other words, let me let me just write the formula down briefly, and then I'll start a different topic. So in other words, time order product of Px1, Pxn. Omega then is the ground state of the interacting theory. And nobody's ever solved any of these interacting theories, so we're sort of sleeping. But we can write down a symbolic expression. It's p of x1, p of xn, e to the i s of p and epsilon, d phi divided by the integral e to the i s of p and epsilon, d phi. And the epsilon here means that you, you've introduced, you, you remember that when, when I did the epsilon, the I epsilon business today and also last time, we took the limit epsilon go, going to zero and really all we cared about was the coefficient of epsilon was positive. Um, and we dropped all of, the, all of the complicated aspects of what the epsilon was. And so here, we also mean that we have the I epsilon um, uh, 
where it should be. Um, uh, in other words, you're going to have something like p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon between the fields, the Fourier transform, the fields and momentum space. And uh, then there's the other part that, that's not quadratic and then we can't do. All right, so I think this is a good time to pause. Um, um, I don't have a, a really good story. I, um, there's actually one on, on the door of my office, but, but unfortunately I have to run down to my office, get it, and run back. Um, and I, excitement because they thought that, um, that this whole process, this anomaly, was um, something they could really analyze and it looked as though it was a breakdown of quantum electric dynamics. And um, so people were really quite interested. But as time went by, they eventually found out what the problem was. And it was what, when they built the, either when they built the accelerator or when they cleaned it up and got it running again after the explosion. Somebody had left, one of the workmen, one of the graduate students, or one of the faculty members, I don't know, somebody had left a can or a bottle of Coca-Cola in the beam line somewhere. And um, this had caused the anomaly, and which people were taking seriously. I remember I was sitting in a, in a seminar where they had the, the, the number of the faculty from MIT had come to listen to the anomaly, the description of the anomaly in the Harvard faculty was just talking about the anomaly. It was all taken very seriously and then eventually they discovered the Coke or Pepsi. I think it was a poor doctor. Anyway, all right, so that's a story. Um, uh, Let's hope that the LHC results aren't um, due to something like that. There, well, I, I was about to go on a, a tangent that I shouldn't do in class, so I'm going to skip that. Um, I think the next thing to do is to go to um, go to uh, say something about electrodynamics and um, to go on with, I mean, Z, for example, has a, has a rather cute description of why it is that opposite charges attract and um, light charges repel. Um, 
and it, I, I encourage you to read that. What I'm going to do is give you the, the sort of um, the nitty gritty of it, and oh, well, not all of the nitty gritty because the nitty gritty is really very long. Um, so, are there, are there any questions? All right. So let me let me review some classical electrodynamics first. And then say something about how you quantize the electromagnetic field. And it turns out that this quantization <coughs> is, is, is easier and more understandable if you, you do use path intervals. So let me first of all say we have this electromagnetic field, I'll call it A sub B. And I'm going to start out in MKS units and then at some point make a transition to natural units. And in fact, it may even be natural Gaussian units. But anyway, um, that's the electromagnetic field. If we um, raise the, uh, the index B, then this is equal to phi over C A. This A is the, is the uh, three-dimensional uh, gauge field. And you can find that with the scale of potential divided by C, and you have the, the full four vector. The magnetic induction B, of course, as you know, is curled A, where this is in A. And, um, one, one nice way of writing that is Bi is epsilon ijk bjbk uh, gjbk bjaj. The electric field, on the other hand, is a little bit more confusing in relativistic notation. Um, e sub i is c times partial A0, partial Xi, minus partial AI, partial X0. So in other words, this is um, minus partial V, partial Xi, minus partial A, one can, partial AI, partial T. Um, X0, you see, I'm being sort of careful here, X0 is C, T, and so the C's cancel here, and then C, A0 is, uh, C, lower A0 is minus B. These notes of walls will be online. They, most of them have been online, but I've, I've added some stuff. And Faraday's tensor, let me use this board, F um, A B is partial A uh, B with respect to X A minus partial A a with respect to xp. And it's anti-symmetric, so this is minus fp a. Um, so the Maxwell equations, of course, are the two homogeneous equations, del dot b is 0, and curl of e plus b dot is 0. These are the homogeneous equations. <coughs> Inhomogeneous equations, again in MKS units, are L dot D is rho 3, and curl of H is J free plus uh, D dot. Um, shall I cut this very short, or do you want to see some? Would you like to hear some of this E and M repeated? I would. You want to hear it repeated? 
Okay, all right. All right, let me say what this F means then. F means free, and it's, so it's the charge, it's the stuff we pay P&M to deliver. Um, in other words, it's the charge and the current that's not uh, attached to bulk matter by molecular forces. It's charge, charges and currents that do not arise from polarization and are not restrained by chemical bonds. That's what we mean by free. Um, now, this equation, by the way, says there are no magnetic monopoles. Um, now, the divergence of H, the divergence of the curl of H vanishes because the divergence of every curl vanishes. So what we have then is zero is divergence of del cross H, and that's equal to the divergence of the free current plus the divergence of d dot. On the other hand, that's the divergence of J free plus, well, this is Gauss's law. And it's important to notice that these two equations are really constraints, whereas these ones have time derivatives so they're equations of motion. These are constraints, there are no time derivatives. And this is saying then rho f dot using Gauss's law, and this is all zero. Well, that means that the free current is conserved. This is a conservation equation, rho dot plus del dot j is zero. Um, And we can look at it in a different way. We can see that um, that zero is the divergence of the free current plus del dot divergence of d dot. We can write that as d by dt of minus rho f plus del dot d and this is zero, that means that this is Gauss's law, you see, the vanishing of this is Gauss's law, and what we're saying here is that Gauss's law is time independent. <coughs> also, Faraday's law, which is this one, says that this constraint is time independent, because what you have is zero is minus the divergence of the kernel D, and that's the partial derivative of the divergence of B, but that's zero because the divergence of a curl is zero, and so this, the vanishing of del dot B is time independent. This is all in the notes online. It's, it's, in, it's in, well actually, I didn't, well all right, I'll put this online tonight. Um, All right, now, of course, when you're doing condensed matter physics or biophysics, this, these J3 and rho 3 and the macroscopic equations are important. By the way, there was a, well, let me just mention this very briefly, but for some reason, people screwed up the, um, stress energy tensor in, in terms of macroscopic fields some years ago, I don't know when, it might have been 100 years ago, it might have been 50 years ago, and um, a professor, I think it's Indian, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, recently pointed out, well he's been pointing it out over the last probably five or 10 years that in fact the right stress energy tensor in terms of these microscopic fields is one that Einstein introduced, um, oh, I don't know, around 1915 or so. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with general relativity, but um, it, uh, 
turns out that the formulas that people were using somewhat casually uh, violate special relativity, is And of course, the Einstein one you might expect got special relativity. So that's just an aside. And, uh, let me now go to the next step here. That is the microscopic equations, which is what we're going to be looking at. Oh my God! It's I had no idea the time was over. All right, so um, let me say I think we should just quit because I'm five minutes or six minutes over, and um, I'll try to.